Okay, everyone, so let's come back to the questions for this evening. And uh, we'll just start from the top. Dear Ajahn, in uh, Sagyuta Nikaya 48.18, practicing, uh, the Sutta talks of the five spiritual faculties as one practicing to realize the fruit of stream entry. Then it goes on to someone who is totally and utterly lax, the five uh, is an outsider here. Is this Sutta saying that even if there is uh, some or weakly present five spiritual faculties that the person is not totally, utterly lacking them, uh, uh, is on the path to stream entry here. Um, I, I don't think that is what it's saying. I think my interpretation of that sutta is that once you are uh, uh, on the path of stream entry, then the five spiritual faculties are actually established in you. Uh, because you have seen with wisdom already, you're very almost a stream enter, so you have seen the Dhamma very close to seeing the Dhamma fully. Uh, in fact, you have seen it so fully that you have to become a stream enter in that lifetime. Uh, so I think what the Sutta does, it shows you one who completely lacks them is the outsider, and then it shows you the one who has them uh, uh, fully uh, integrated at the minimum level, uh, which is the one who is practicing for the stream entry. And then there's all those in between who sometimes have the five faculties and sometimes don't. Uh, and these are all the people who are pract ordinary people who are practicing the Dhamma who are in between there. Uh, they're not mentioned in the, in the Sutta, but you sort of have, they're sort of implied uh, by that uh, distinction uh, uh, between the two. Uh. Okay, I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> The suttas are mostly pitched at such a high level, uh, areas or at the very least those who get into samadhi. Surely the vast majority of the Buddha's disciples were like us, struggling to keep their mind still for just a few minutes. Uh, how come the suttas don't contain more basic practices like forgiveness, living in harmony, dealing with scattered minds? Uh, uh, that, uh, <laughs> perhaps that's why there are so many commentaries, jatakita, etc., to fill in the gaps, flesh it out. Many thanks. Um, yes, I think that is one reason, uh, but I think also the re one of the reasons is because the higher you come on the path, the more kind of refined things are and the more different things are from ordinary experience, uh, and the harder it is to really understand what is going on. Uh, the basic things of the path, everyone can sort of figure out. Uh, I haven't touched so much on the basic things, but the basic things are things like virtue, kindness, right speech, right action, uh, and these kind of things. Uh, and uh, they are sort of, sort of, we sort of almost understand what that is. You don't need the Buddha to explain those things in great detail. Uh, where it gets hard is where it comes to uh, uh, developing the mind in the right way, overcoming the hindrances, developing the seven factors of awakening, all of this. Uh, that is the hard part. That is where things are so different, uh, and the Buddha has to spend more time with those things. Uh, that is my guess why the suttas are pitched at such a high level, simply because that is where it is most demanding to follow the teaching. Yeah. Uh, but you are right, uh, and maybe, maybe one should focus more on the basic things. Uh, in fact, uh, the point of many of these high teachings is not uh, the reason I go through them, is because many of them are actually applicable at a lower level as well. Uh, it's just that they are, you know, they when they are developed fully, uh, that's when you are a stream mentor. But it, when they are developed to a lesser extent, uh, uh, that is where all the rest of us are at. And for that reason, uh, it is okay to, uh, I think, to look at these things uh, because they are applicable to some extent to all of us. Uh, uh, one of the main things that I always like to focus on uh, uh, during a retreat, because I have found it to be so useful in my own practice, uh, and that is to d how to deal with uh, uh, thoughts that are hindrances on the path, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of uh, sensual desire and these kind of things. Uh, and I've dealt with that a little bit already, uh, but I think these are the things that are really applicable for everybody. Uh, they're kind of intermediate stage, they're not the very most basic, uh, but they are, uh, they can be at least intermediate stage, depending on how coarse they are, and all these kind of things. Uh, and I will get back to that later on because I, I always uh, like to talk about this in quite a bit of depth uh, on these retreats. Uh, and uh, so we will get, get back to that later on again. Uh. So, um, yeah, 
commentaries and data cartels, yeah, so, sometimes these things are very useful uh, uh, because they can fill in the gap. Sometimes the data cartels are, are directly harmful, I think, uh, in a kind of... Uh, uh, because sometimes they are so contrary to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, so sometimes they give you completely the wrong idea. Like the Jataka tale that um, I translated recently in the Vinaya. It's a Jataka tale. It's a story in the Jataka. It also exists in the Jatakas and also exists in the Vinaya. And the story is about this hero who kind of uh, uh, does all of these amazing things. And at the end of the story, he gains the princess and the country and everything. Yeah. And it's like, a, it's like a fairy tale. Yeah completely opposite to how the Buddha teaches the Dhamma. It's kind of, uh, <laughs> you wonder how it made it in there and how it was kind of passed by the, by the kind of right view committee because <laughs> definitely that was very, very dodgy uh, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, so the Jataka tales, we've got to be careful with them. Sometimes they are like folk stories that have been passed down maybe in Indian society and then been adapted to a Buddhist setting. Uh, but sometimes they are really kind of uh, not to be relied upon too much. Um, so, uh, anyway. Okay. Next question. Dear Venerable Ajahn, what a great retreat. What a marvelous teaching. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. <laughs> that is very pretty. Um, okay, good. I'm very glad that you, you are enjoying it. So, uh, does the term loka vidu also refer to the knower of the five khandhas of uh, sentient beings, our internal world. Thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, because in the end, everything is really the internal world. That's what everything comes back to. So when you talk about rebirth, rebirth is really just an alternative way that your internal world manifests after you die. Uh, so you get reborn in a higher realm. It just means that your internal, your experience of the world changes. Uh, uh, I, make some kind of quantum leap almost, and the eternal world takes on a new kind of way of seeing the world. That's what rebirth is, uh, is that quantum leap change in how you experience the world. Uh, so ultimately, everything refers back to the five khandhas. That is quite right. Uh, and that is why, in, in a sense, why the idea of rebirth really, as I said, it's about suffering and happiness, yeah? The scope for suffering and happiness, and ultimately that, of course, comes back precisely to the five khandhas uh, and your inner world. Uh. Um, two, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta that you have been teaching us, uh, Ajahn Buddha said, uh, uh, pointing to the manas who were coming uh, at a distance. Mendicants, if you have not seen the devas yet, look at the malas. Uh, it's actually not the malas, it's actually the, 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 um, uh, not, uh, not the, vaj, the um, lichavis, lit, thank you, lichavis, exactly. So the, the, the kind of the aristocrats of the Vajjian Republic called the lichavis. Uh, but anyway, you, you're quite right, the general idea is right. Uh, they are of similar splendor or words to that effect. Uh, your views, please. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, that's an interesting, interesting one, uh, and uh, you wonder what is, uh, wonder why exactly the Buddha is uh, is pointing that out, uh, and uh, uh, I, I suppose well, one thing that it shows you, it certainly shows you that the Buddha took the idea of devas uh, quite seriously, yeah, even to the point of. Uh, uh, kind of pointing it out to, to people. It also shows that many of the monks did not have a, a kind of these insights into the other realms and they needed to have it pointed out. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't really know exactly why it is there. I did talk about this before when I went through it. I can't remember what I said anymore at that point. Uh, but it may just be something to kind of to, uh, to remind the monks maybe that there are these realms uh, and that uh, there is a often a close connection between maybe the human realm and these other realms. Uh, it is not as different as we may think it is. The, more, uh, the problem sometimes with these other realms is that they seem so foreign to us, uh, so different, uh, but actually it is just an extension really of the human realm. Uh, uh, and that is, so they're not all that foreign at all. Uh, so I think this may, may be one of the, uh, the reasons. Uh, um, uh, not sure. I'll put it to one side, and if I come up with some other reasons why he might have said that, I'll, I'll let you know at a later stage. Yeah. Dear Ajahn, how does one recognize the scallywag monks and nuns and the false teachings? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, 
I'm glad when my colleague was not looking at me at this particular point. So I might be. Look at. There are so many Buddhist sects with their own rites and rituals. Did the, the Buddha teach rituals? Uh, thank you for explaining. Um, did the Buddha teach rituals? Uh, um, yes, he did. Uh, because uh, in the time of the Buddha, there were also rituals. They would bow down to each other according to seniority, just like we bow down now. Sometimes I feel we bow down a little bit too much. I'm not sure if we have to bow down quite as much as we do here. But, uh, you know, bowing, there's not, no harm in bowing, that's for sure. Uh, so that goes back to the time of the Buddha, uh, the way they treated each other according to seniority, sit, seating in a certain sequence, and all these kind of things. These are really rituals in a way. Uh, it is true that I think in the modern day, the amount of rituals has expanded exponentially a little bit. Uh, yeah, over time, that's often what happens. Uh, so in Buddhism, I think sometimes you do see too many rituals. And I must admit, I'm quite happy to reduce rituals uh, quite a lot. Uh, but rituals, when done in the right way, can be very useful. Uh, they can be good for the heart, good for the emotional qualities. Uh, you know, you, when you bow down to the Buddha and you have a feeling for who the Buddha is, uh, or you bow down to a senior monk like Ajahn Brahm when you respect him, it actually feels good. Uh, it feels nice. There's something wholesome about that, something positive. Uh, if you're forced to bow down when you don't want to, then it is bad. Uh, so just bow when you feel like it. You don't have to follow uh, you know, what er everybody else does in this room. Just follow your own heart, what feels right to you. Uh, you never have, never should feel forced to bow down. There should not be a kind of pressure just because everyone else bows down. You have to bow down. Do what feels right for you, uh, and then you're okay. Uh. Um, so rituals can be good uh, if they are useful for you. A bit of chanting can be nice if it feels good and it give, puts you in a positive mind state. I really like to chant the Metta Sutta in the morning. It puts me in a good mind state. It reminds me of various qualities of the Buddha. I find it very useful. I don't usually do it in my kuti, but I, it's nice to do it at least on retreat when I come and teach these retreats. So a little bit of like that sort of stuff is good, but don't allow rituals to take over, to become what Buddhist life is about. That is where you go wrong. Don't think that rituals have some kind of magical effect that is going to kind of take you to heavenly realm or whatever, just because you do certain rituals. Use them wisely. Use them for the benefit they have right here and right now to support you in your virtue, your kindness, your meditation, and all of those kind of things. And then you're doing it in the right way. Yeah. But uh, coming back to the first part, how do you recognize the scallywag monks and nuns and the false teachings? Well, this, the way to do that is, first of all, to make sure that the monastics practice the vinaya properly. Yeah. Sometimes you find monastics who, don't, who barely practice the vinaya at all. Sometimes you find so-called monastics who are not monastics at all. You look at them closely and you see the genes under the robes. Yeah? <laughs> Sometimes you find that and then you think, oh, oh okay, I better be careful with that one. Sometimes they put on the robe, go begging in the street, and they take the robe off again and they use the money for whatever purpose. You get these kind of monks as well sometimes. That is, that is super duper scallywag. That's really scallywag. Yeah. Uh, but uh, really, the, a monks and nuns should be keeping their precepts. That's kind of what the precepts are there for. And this is kind of how you, how you recognize that. And if they keep the precepts properly, the better they keep them, the better it usually is. That's one way of looking at it. Um, another way, and this is one of the reasons why I like to go back to the teachings of the Buddha, is to give you an insight into what these teachings are, give you a bit more independence in Buddhism. If you always rely on the monastics to be able to tell you what is right and wrong, you have no independence. You're bound by what they tell you, and then you cannot make any independent judgment of what is right and wrong. So I think the, the right way for monastics to teach is to give everyone an ability to judge for themselves, at least a little bit independently, so that you're not 100% dependent on monastics to tell you everything, because that is where the problem starts to arise. Yeah, if you are dependent on others to tell you everything, it means that you, uh, you have, it's very hard to make independent judgment. So use the teachings that we have now and assess based on that what roughly what a good monastic should be like, what they should, what the right view is. And if they teach you weird stuff, uh, and there are some really weird teachings sometimes out there, uh, 
I, I, I hesitate to mention anything because it kind of may, may not be right to mention anyone in particular, but there are some very strange teachings. They sound more like Star Wars than the Dhamma, to be honest with you, some of these teachings. Uh, it is basically that bad. Uh, so uh, just be honest with yourself, uh, and if you see something that you think looks dodgy, uh, then at least be skeptical. You don't have to reject things outright. Uh, you don't have to use harsh judgments. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but if you see something that looks dodgy, dodgy, then at least reserve your judgment a little bit. Uh, yeah, there is good grounds for having doubts if you see dodgy things happening here. Okay. Okay, uh, recently, due to resistance, ill will arose in the following case. I would like to know what more I can do in the future, especially with the uh, first two right efforts. Thank you. Driving at 110, striving not to be late for an important thing. A lady was going at 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, whoa, that's Dukkha. I know what you mean. I know what you're talking about now. <laughs> Finally passing her, I saw uh, she was quite chilled and seemingly uncaring of the cars behind. I felt angry and swear words came to mind. <laughs> Going on after five minutes, a man was doing the same thing. I was a mixture of resignation, resistant indignation, outrage and frustration. Finally he turned. I wanted to do something about these emotions which I felt uh, the faint stir of guilt about. Then <laughs> I realized best just to accept them. I remembered my conditionality. I calmed down, later asked for forgiveness by myself. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a nice little, nice little story right there. And uh, this is what happened. Driving is very kind of, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's really hard. I'm really glad I don't drive anymore, actually, because driving, you get all these emotions coming up. And uh, I think one of the members of the Buddhist society, he said many years ago, when you drive, you should always have put, listen to a Dhamma talk while you drive or listen to some kind of positive message so that you don't get carried away by road rage, yeah, <laughs> these kind of things. So uh, the idea is, uh, you know, the idea is always to remember that people are conditioned in what they do. Uh, they don't do things to be evil. This, this lady who was really chilled and driving along, she was probably really happy and content. Maybe she was completely oblivious of the cars behind her. She was happily driving along and kind of content with that. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, who, who knows what her mind, mental state was at, at that particular point. The one thing that we do know is that she was conditioned somehow, and she didn't really have much, uh, uh, she couldn't really do anything different because of that conditioning process uh, that she was uh, forced to play out at that particular time. Uh, and even if she was a really evil lady, uh, yeah, really evil, and she thought, yeah, these cars are behind, I'm gonna make them go slow, why? Because I love to make other people upset and angry. Uh, if, if she thinks like that, uh, then it, you, you have to feel sorry for her, yeah? Because someone who thinks like that, they are in serious trouble as far as happiness is concerned, as far as everything on the, as far as, you know, having a good life is concerned, all you can have for a person like that is compassion, because they are so ridiculously stupid if they think like that. Uh, so either way, if she was just obliviously carrying along, didn't know what was going on, uh, or if she was really evil or somewhere in between, uh, either way, the right attitude is to think it's conditioned. Uh, it has to be like this. The world is full of all kinds of people who do all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, and the only way to deal with that is just to allow it to be. You're never going to be able to solve it all. You have to accept it. That is basically what it is like. Yeah. So remember that people are largely like robots. They're playing out their conditioning. They are trapped by their personality. Nobody can step out of their personality and say, I'm going to be someone different. It's impossible. Your personality traps you. All you can do is gradually develop out of it and become a different person over time. But you can't step out of it just like that. And once you understand how trapped everyone is, uh, yeah, we're all trapped in this way, uh, you start to have so much more compassion for the world. Uh, people who are bad, who do stupid things, who are silly, who say bad things to others, who do bad actions, yeah, they are just, they are trapped. 
they think that they're in charge, they think that they kind of uh, gleefully do bad things to others, but actually they're just trapped in their own stupid conditioning. Yeah. The more you get this, uh, the more you can forgive and let go and accept uh, and shrug your shoulders. Okay, I'm going to be late for that meeting today. What can you do sometimes? Uh? Okay. Dear Ajahn, who wrote the suttas and when are they all in one book? What is the connection with the Nikayas, e.g. Majjhima Nikaya, etc.? Thank you. Okay, so uh, the suttas is just a word that I use to refer to the four Nikayas. There is a, a Nikaya is a collection of teachings, yeah, Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length teachings. It consists of 152 suttas. 152 individual teachings. They're added together in a collection called the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings. There's four such collections, middle length sayings, long sayings, connected sayings, and numerical sayings. And they contain all together, the number of suttas is highly disputed, but the number of suttas that are substantial may be couple of thousand substantial suttas and a lot of small, minor, insubstantial suttas. A couple of thousand, maybe, maybe not even that many, maybe only one thousand. I haven't really counted. It depends what you mean by substantial. Who wrote the suttas? And uh, the suttas are, um, if you look at the suttas, they have, a, I was talking about this at the very beginning of the retreat, uh, the suttas have a certain coherence to them. There's a language that is very unified. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the culture that is described in the suttas, the ideas that are there, it is all kind of a unified whole. Uh, and it all points back to a certain place and a certain time in history. Uh, everything happens in a small area of northeast India, the Ganges plain, that's where everything happens in the suttas, uh, and only a small part of that. Uh, and the uh, historical evidence points back to a very specific time period. Uh, everything points to this being spoken by one individual two and a half thousand years ago. And that individual is now known as the Buddha. Actually, he was known as the Buddha for a long time already. Uh, so this is, uh, this is basically what we have today. We do have the teachings of the Buddha spoken at that time. And we know that for a large number of reasons. Uh, that's my argument anyway. I, there are scholars who are skeptical about this, but uh, I, I think that the skepticism is, is really kind of uh, oh, silly and over the top. There are other scholars who would agree with what I'm saying. Uh, and um, so it all points back to one person at one particular time in, in history. Uh, and we know that also for as I said, many reasons. One of the reasons is that very early on, the various schools of Buddhism, they separated out and they went into different directions. This happened around the time of Ashoka. Ashoka was the greatest emperor in Indian history. He existed about 260 BC or thereabouts. So about 150 years maybe after the Buddha. And he was famous for sending out missionaries or sending out Dhamma Dutas to large parts of India. Some of them went to Sri Lanka. Venerable Mahinda, who was his son, went all the way to Sri Lanka and he converted the royalty of Sri Lanka at that time and Sri Lanka became a Buddhist nation and that is where the Theravada, the Pali Suttas come from. Other of these missionaries went to the north of India, to Kashmir, Gandhara, uh, and these became the Sarvastivadin and Dharmaguptaka schools of Buddhism. And eventually they went from there and they went onto the Silk Road. The Silk Road is very close to Gandhara and Kashmir. Uh, and then uh, on the Silk Road, they followed the Silk Road all the way into China. And that is how Buddhism came to China, uh, starting around the year zero uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Christian calendar. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, they went to China, they were translated into Chinese, written down using Chinese characters in middle, what is called Middle Chinese. This is like Chinese that existed 1,500, 600, 700 years ago. And uh, if you take those suttas that exist now, they still exist now in Chinese, and you compare them with Pali, even though they have been separated for 2,300 years, even though they were handed down by different schools, uh, you read those basic suttas, uh, and they are very, very similar to each other. Uh, 
That is kind of astonishing, isn't it? Uh, and it shows you the conservatism that these uh, suttas have been looked after with by the monastics especially, been very conservative, very careful in how to deal with them. Uh, so everything points back to this time period uh, at a certain about 400, 500 BC to a particular individual in a particular area. Uh, and that is where they arose. Uh, so, um, yeah, so if you want to look at that, uh, these teachings of the Buddha, then uh, um, uh, the four Nikayas, uh, numerical discourses, connected discourses, long discourses, and uh, middle-length discourses. Uh, there is also a sutta, an anthology of suttas called the, in the Buddha's word, uh, translated by one of the prime translators of suttas called Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, an American monk uh, who is a, is a very good translator. Uh, and uh, they have good introductions, they have nice footnotes at the end and things to explain things. So it's a nice place to start. Uh, you can also now go to a website called suttacentral.net, suttacentral.net, uh, and you find all the suttas there in fairly modern translations. Uh, really nice translations, really good to read. Uh, and I don't know if you heard, I was reading out one of the suttas yesterday, and Mara was coming to the Buddha, asking the Buddha to kind of take final Nibbana, yeah, extinguish, and the Buddha replies, relax, Mara. <laughs> Modern translation, yeah. Is, <laughs> you can kind of, you get, you get what's going on straight away. Yeah? And actually, I find this so nice when you have modern translations because you feel this suit has come alive. Yeah, they speak in the same language as we do. If you have some kind of ancient language, and this can be sometimes the problems with certain translations that put them deliberately into archaic language to kind of elevate the suttas. But that just creates a distance between you and the suttas. You don't feel the Buddha is talking to you if he uses some kind of highfalutin language, some Victorian terms, that kind of stuff. Breath, instead of using monastics, brethren, yeah, that kind of, that kind of language. Brethren, what are you talking about? Some of the translations have these kind of translations. So, uh, 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 so actually, it is very nice to read these things in the modern language. I don't mind at all re reading Relax Mara because it's, you know, it actually makes good sense. And there are, that, that may be kind of on the really relaxed side, but generally speaking, the language is really good. Uh, and these translations are by a monk called Bhante Sujato, who Venerable Akalako actually lives with him in Sydney, uh, in a small monastery in Sydney. Uh, and he is the one who's done all of these translations. And uh, so he, yeah, we know him very well because he stayed at Bodhinyana Monastery for many years. Uh, so he's a very good friend of myself and everyone over here. Uh, very reliable, super, a super duper clever monk yeah, who has uh, been able to translate all of these four Nikayas from scratch from Pali. Yeah. So that is a few hints for you yeah. and if you want me to uh, uh, kind of give you some more details about that please just see me at any time come to the, the questions uh, uh, the questions the interviews or whatever you, interviews can be used for that sort of thing as well I'm happy to help people any kind of Dhamma things uh, so please uh, come there if you want to ask more about these things uh, dear Ajahn I like reading Dhammapada I, I can I understand why that is because Dhammapada is often very inspiring I find the verses in it inspiring and also accessible than the suttas. Is Dhammapada considered authentic? Do they convey right view? Um, I think, generally speaking, the Dhammapada conveys right view. I, uh, is it authentic? Well, it depends what we mean by authentic. I, I, do the verses in the Dhammapada, were they actually spoken by the Buddha? Uh, some of them probably were, because some of the suttas or some of the verses in the Dhammapada are also found in the four Nikayas. Yeah? So they are kind of duplicates of what is found in the four Nikayas. And uh, so they are very, uh, uh, I think though they are very likely to be authentic. Uh, things like, uh, you know, um, um, hatred is never overcome by hatred in this world. Hatred is always overcome by love. This is an eternal law. One of the beautiful verses in the Dhammapada, very kind of stirring and kind of, you know it is true as soon as you hear this kind of thing. So, so quite a few of them are found both in the suttas and also the Dhammapada. But the Dhammapada is a large collection and a lot of the verses there are not found anywhere else apart from the Dhammapada itself. So it's probably a compilation that was compiled over a long period of time. And so it's hard to really say how authentic they are in terms of coming from the Buddha. But 
uh, there is little in there that I'm aware of that is obviously wrong view. Uh, so if you enjoy good, nice verse uh, that has a, a good Buddhist message, uh, I would certainly, I think it's certainly okay to read the Dhammapada. I don't think there should be any problem there with reading that. Uh, uh, there are also other books, if you enjoy verse, there are also other books, uh, Buddhist books, that have some really nice verse in them uh, that you, I would recommend you to read. There is the Tera Gata and the Teri Gata, and these are the verses of the ancient elder monks and elder nuns, uh, and they can also be found on suttacentral.net if you want to read them straight off the internet. Uh, and uh, they are often very beautiful and inspiring verses. Some of them are no doubt very ancient, and they may very well go back to some of the monks and nuns that you actually read about in the suttas. Quite possibly they go back to them. So that, that is very nice to read. Then there is a book called the Sutta Nipata. Uh, Sutta Nipata is a collection of largely verse with a little bit of, a, um, of prose introductions sometimes. And uh, there's two books in there in particular that are very ancient, one called the Attakavaga, I mean the chapter of the Eights, uh, another one called the Parayanavaga, the chapter on, on crossing over. Uh, and both of those are very ancient because they exist also in other schools of Buddhism. Uh, some of the other verses in there too can be quite, uh, are probably quite ancient, uh, like for example the Ratana Sutta, uh, Ratana means jewel, the jewel sutta, which is about the triple gem, the qualities of the triple gem, also very inspiring. And then you have famous suttas like the Mahamangala Sutta and the Metta Sutta, they are also found in the Sutta Nipata, all these famous suttas that are often chanted, like the Metta Sutta we chant in the morning here, that is found there. Uh, Mahamangala Sutta, another important sutta that is chanted a lot in traditional Buddhist countries, also a very beautiful sutta about some of the basic qualities that we should think about on the Buddhist path. Uh, so uh, there you are, those are some, some uh, examples uh, for you, uh, and uh, so please enjoy those beautiful uh, verses. Uh, Ajahn, I apologize for not paying attention today. What were the Te Vidja? the three insights, rebirth, karma, and the last one. The last one is the uh, insight uh, when you become an arahant, yeah? The final insight, bang, you become an arahant, that is the last one. Uh, that is when you see the Four Noble Truths uh, for the final time, and it fully transforms your, your uh, mental makeup, uh, that is the last one. Uh. Okay. Dear Venerable Brahmali, there was a mention of concern of people coughing. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Uh, the two main worries were catching an infection and disturbing meditation. Uh, is it not plainly obvious that sickness is part and parcel of life? Uh, there are bound to be noises in group meditation when someone coughs. Uh, it is an excellent opportunity to extend metta, may you be well, may you be comfortable, and getting back to the breath. It works wonderfully for me, would value your thoughts. I ag agree with you, I think it is impossible to have a room with so many people together and there not being a little bit of noise, a little bit of coughing, and uh, so please remember, everyone in this room is like a robot, yeah? <laughs> if the robot program says cough, they will cough. If the robot program says move, they will move. If the robot program says make some kind of random noise, they will make random noise. Yeah? <laughs> so remember that, so don't take it too seriously. It is just people doing people things, the world doing its things, and really it is unavoidable. And some people are not as good as being sensitive as others. It's just the nature of people being different. So, so don't think that other people are doing anything bad, even if they seem may seem less sensitive. It is just the nature that is different. It's okay. And then when you think like that, and as you say here, uh, you extend compassion and you extend metta instead of uh, having a fault-finding mind, uh, then you are doing exactly the right thing. So I, that's a very good way of thinking about things. Uh, it's nothing to do with you if other coughs, yeah? Just let it go. Uh, as soon as you latch onto those things and you think that they have done something bad, it leaves a residue in your mind and you cannot carry that on with you into the future. It destroys your meditation. Uh, if you realize it's got nothing to do with you, the cough is there one moment, the next moment is gone, and you are back with your meditation straight away. No residue in your mind. 
such a big difference with tiny little difference in the way you perceive and it makes all the difference in how your meditation flows on. So indeed, so thank you for that. <clears throat> Ajahn, regarding the realms of existence, some say it depends on the mental state. If one does evil but truly and deeply believes he does good, will this subconscious deep belief actually uh, bump him to a good realm since there is supposedly no judgment God, uh, vice versa for one who does good uh, but thinks he does evil due to uh, wrong companion and advice. Uh, um, they say that delusion is one of the worst things. Uh, yeah, delusion uh, is uh, one of the kind of the really bad things that happens in the person. So if you think that you are doing good uh, while you are doing uh, bad, uh, uh, but you think it's good, uh, maybe in the short run it may kind of keep you up and you will not feel, feel the bad consequences of it, uh, but in the long run it's going to have a very detrimental effect uh, because eventually you come out of that delusion, eventually you get a more kind of idea of reality or that delusion takes you even further astray. Uh, eventually there is a, a comeuppance and uh, you have to uh, feel, you have to get the results of the bad things that you do. Uh, so even if there's a temporary reprieve because you feel good about yourself and you don't judge yourself too harshly, eventually they will come back to you. So um, it, it is, as you say, very complex. And this is one of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya 136 that says that uh, sometimes some people do bad, but they don't receive the bad results of that straight away. They actually get reborn in a good realm, even if they have done bad. Yeah, so, uh, but late, at some stage it will catch up with you. At some stage it will be bad. So it is, uh, uh, regardless of how you look at this, it's going to be bad down the track. But you are right, it's very complicated. Yeah, it is very difficult to know what is going to, how these things are going to work out. And, uh, uh, but the overall picture is that doing bad is going to lead at some stage to bad consequences. Dear Ajahn, my question is, did the Buddha cannot remember the past life, 91 eons, or he decided to stop looking because there is no first point of delusion is found? Thank you. Okay, there is a nice picture of a smile. I wasn't sure whether it was a skull or a smile, but I think it's a smile. I, was <laughs> I think a smile is what it is. So, uh, uh, yes, he's supposed to have called, recalled 91 eons according to some suttas. Uh, he stopped looking because there is no first point and delusion cannot be found. Well, in a sense, but I, you know, he, he may have stopped looking, but I, the reason he may have stopped looking is because after a while you're just fed up, you have looked enough, uh, and you can only go so far. Yeah, you, sometimes you 91 eons, gee, but that's a long way already, and you're kind of, after a while, probably fed up with seeing all these lives, all you see is just stupid actions again and again and again, uh, probably incredibly boring after a while. Uh, and uh, so there comes a point when you just give up because you know that uh, you, you cannot go on forever. Life is short. You've got to get on with teaching all the bhikkhus and the people in the world out of compassion. You can't just kind of think back forever. Huh? So uh, that is why uh, he, he stopped, uh, yeah, because uh, simply because it was just too, too much. Uh, so I don't think it has anything to do with cannot remember. I think he could remember if he wanted to but uh, that he had other priorities after, uh, after a certain uh, point. Okay, so, uh, okay. Dear Ajahn, I have 100% confidence in Dhamma teaching and practice. Yay, that's wonderful, 100%, okay. And I do appreciate the downside of all the world activities and concern. Excellent. At the same time, uh, part of me is I don't mind being uh, promoted at work and completing my PhD here, but no Ferrari, please, thanks. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So you don't mind being, yeah, sure, there's no need to be being mind being promoted. There's no, there's no need to not complete your PhD. Please do so. Perfectly okay. Uh, it, it is not wrong to do those things, but do them with kindness, do them with care. It is not what you do, but how you do it that really matters in this world. Yeah. So do things well. Yeah? 
One, does it mean I only have superficial knowledge rather than real insight? <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't really tell from that. It's just not enough. Um, the chances that you have real insight are pretty small. Remember that deep insight into Buddhism is extremely rare. Uh, how superficial knowledge is, it's very, it's very hard to, to gauge. It can maybe already have some knowledge. Uh, maybe you already feel that you're heading in the right direction. Uh, but the full insight, deep insight, is very profound. It takes really deep meditation to get there. So you, unless you had some incredibly powerful experience in meditation, uh, the chances are that your insight is maybe middling. Yeah, maybe middling, uh, but not that really deep. Uh, but if you feel that your confidence is so strong and you're heading in the right direction, you're doing the right thing, it's wonderful. Just keep on practicing, keep on doing the right thing and see what happens. Sometimes there comes a point when you gain so much confidence, you want to become a monastic. Yeah, this is one of the consequences sometimes of deep confidence and deep understanding of these teachings because you want to spend your entire life just practicing these teachings you realize that all the other stuff is really just a stopgap and it doesn't really get you anywhere. Okay, you can study for the PhD, but maybe even better to study the suttas than study the PhD. Yeah. Get a PhD in sutta reading, in Pali or, or whatever. Actually, forget about the PhD, just learn the Pali and the suttas. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. So these things may happen or they may not happen. Yeah. Sometimes people do really well and they, they don't actually ever become monastics. You don't have to become a monastic. Yeah. Okay, does transmigration mean rebirth? Uh, Im immigrant of nowhere, is that what it says? Immigrant of nowhere? Uh, does transmigration mean rebirth? Yes, uh, transmigration means rebirth. That's exactly what it, it is referring to. Uh, okay. Uh, um, anyway, not sure what you mean by that, so I'll, I'll just leave that one out for now. So it, yes, it does mean rebirth. Uh, so, uh, good, okay, very good. If you want to follow up on that because I didn't answer properly, please feel free to do so. That's true for everybody. Please feel free to follow up if I don't get your question or I don't give a full enough answer here. Dear sir, if a meditator develops his meditation up to the stage three of application of mindfulness and sees the samadhi nimitta, does he lose defilements in the process? Every stage you move forward in your meditation, you temporarily lose defilements, but only temporarily. The defilements die down, and, uh, but it is an opportunity to gain an insight into what the mind with less defilements is like. This is always very useful, because when you know what the mind of less defilements is like, it motivates you on, in the practice, because you know a different reality. It's always very useful to see a different reality because at the very least you get a glimpse into what is possible. Every time you get deeper in meditation, you get more of a glimpse of what this path can give you. And it's pretty awesome. Yeah, let's face it. It's absolutely, it's really, really awesome. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is kind of the Buddhist path. So, uh, yes. So especially when you come to Samadhi Nimitta, things start to get really awesome at that particular point. If yes, then those defilements will be gone permanently, as you said today. No, they will be gone only temporarily. They only become permanently gone once you get deep insight, the insight which kind of finally abolishes the defilements once and for all. At that stage, can the meditator be called a stream winner? No, Samadhi Nimitta is not enough to become a stream enterer. You have to uh, have insight into the five khandas, uh, see them in terms of the three characteristics. Uh, you have to see the full emptiness of your entire experiential world. Uh, when you see that your experiential world is uh, empty of any inherent essence, uh, that is when you become a stream enterer. Uh, you see that there's no self, uh, everything is impermanent. Uh, dukkha pervades everything. Uh, that's what you see here. Uh. So uh, stream entry is actually an insight uh, an insight that is based on samadhi. One of the important sayings in the suttas is that uh, samadhi is necessary for yata, bhuta, jnana, dasana. Yata, bhuta, jnana, dasana means seeing and knowing things according to reality. That can only happen based on samadhi. You need samadhi for that to happen. Huh? 
So uh, get some really good samadhi first of all, ideally one of the jhana states, and then you can uh, gain insight and become a stream mentor afterwards. Uh, samadhi nimitta probably uh, would probably not be enough. You probably have to go deeper than that. Uh. Okay. <laughs> so um, then we have the next one. Dear Ajahn, really enjoy the Sutra classes. They are amazing. Thank you. Here. Please explain or expand the four factors of stream entry here. Okay, four factors of stream entry. Uh, the, full, the full confidence in the Buddha, yeah? the, uh, the unshakable confidence, uh, because you have seen the teachings for yourself, you know that the Buddha must have been enlightened because you have seen exactly what the Buddha saw. And that is exactly the formula I was reading out today. The Buddha uh, awakened one, uh, uh, it be so, the it be so formula, yeah? the uh, supreme teachers of gods and humans uh, uh, and, and all of that. Uh, uh, that is basically the insight into the Buddha's awakening. You're unshakable about that. And because uh, you know the Buddha was awakened, you also know that the Dhamma, the teachings that he taught, they, it works. Uh, so you have full confidence in the teaching. It follows from having confidence in the Buddha. Because you have confidence in the Buddha, you know that his teaching also must be true. Uh, and because his teachings are there, and those teachings are efficacious, they work, they give rise to the same results, you also have full confidence in the noble Sangha. You know that there will be people in the world who have same insights as the Buddha, because the teachings are effective. So this is a full knowledge of these things. You don't have any doubt about these things anymore. It's confirmed confidence. The last one, factor of stream entry, is that you have the uh, virtue, beloved of the Noble Ones, uh, you become uh, perfected, if you like, in virtue. Uh, um, and what that means is that your virtue is, I think it says, it is unblemished, it is uh, uh, it, it basically, it is a kind of, um, it is there all the time, it is a virtue that leads to samadhi, samadhi, sangvatanika, uh, sila the sila that leads to samadhi, the sila that is not grasped. You don't need to grasp it anymore because it is natural. It comes out of you naturally, you, you, you know, and that's why you don't need to grasp it. Aparamatta is the Pali for that. And there's a long uh, series of adjectives saying how the sila is pure and unbroken and all of these kind of things. It is buddhisa, it leads to awakening, it is freeing, it is a liberating virtue. I can't remember all the, uh, the adjectives and words that I use there just off the top of my head, but that gives you some idea. So it means that your practice, your, your, your way of living is always coming from, not always, but generally coming from wholesome states inside of you. Huh? You're always leaning in that direction, huh? yeah, always, uh, because you know the danger in unwholesome states through your personal experience. Uh. So also mental states as well. Yeah, you also have pure mental states. You don't go around. To, you don't go around angry anymore once you become a stream entry. Your anger may overcome you briefly, but then it goes very quickly again. Uh, the same thing with desires and delusions. All of these things are largely just come more or less temporarily and then leave again. Uh, and one of the qualities of the stream entry is that if they do make a mistake, and sometimes they do, uh, they will uh, they will confess the uh, offense straight away. Uh, because they know that this is the way to get out of that thing, and then they uh, can forgive themselves and then carry on afterwards. So. Also with regards to rebirth, uh, parents care for their children and indeed uh, live their life for the benefit of the children. So life as a parent goes on and on from life to life. Uh, uh, to stop the parenthood cycle, does it mean that we encourage our children not to have children? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think the best thing to do, you don't really need to encourage your children one way or the other, just let them decide for themselves what they want to do. Uh, you don't really stop any cycle that way because the reason we get reborn is not because of, uh, not because of we kind of, we want children. The reason we get reborn is because of defilement. So you, you get reborn regardless of uh, whether you have children or not. People are going to get reborn regardless. So it depends on what kind of life you want to live. What kind of life do your children want to live? If they don't want to have children, 
good. If they want to have children, okay, so be it. You know, it's not neither right nor wrong. It depends on how you do it and, and, and all of these kind of things. So uh, uh, you, you don't really carry on this uh, cycle just by caring for your children and having children. That is not how the cycle goes on. The reason the cycle goes on is because of craving and defilements. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the people say, I heard this many times, I don't want to kind of have children because uh, uh, this world is so much problems and who knows where the world is heading and all these kind of things. But remember, those beings, they have to get reborn anyway. Uh, if you don't have children, they get reborn somewhere else. If you have children, well, maybe they come into a nice family. Maybe they come with some nice people, good Buddhists to practice kindness. And maybe that is a benefit for those children. So it is not wrong to have children from that point of view. But if you feel that life is better without children, many people feel that. There's no reason you should have children. Absolutely no reason at all. Sometimes society kind of expects you to have children, but forget about blooming society. Yeah, instead, just do what you feel is right. Uh, other people's expectations are irrelevant. Uh, people have so many strange expectations. Uh, and there's no reason why we should have children if we don't want them. Uh, so uh, just go with the flow, see what works best. Uh, and uh, and uh, your children, encourage them to be kind, and encourage them to be caring, encourage them to kind of have a, uh, maybe some spiritual life as a backup or whatever, uh, but don't uh, encourage them to make specific decisions because that is so individual and it's so hard to know what is right for other people. Uh, okay. Dear Ajahn, when watching the breath, is one supposed to ignore the feelings such as pain, irritation, itchiness of the skin, etc., and continue to pay attention to the breath? Or are we supposed to stop paying attention to the breath and pay attention to the feeling? Yeah. Thank you with Metta. Thank you for the wonderful teachings. Okay. Um, if you can, the best thing to do is, if you are able, is to ignore the itchiness and the pain. If you can, it is not always possible. Sometimes the pain just gets too much or the itchiness gets too much and it's very hard to ignore it. But if you can ignore it, uh, that is really the best way. Uh, and the more stronger your uh, samadhi and mindfulness become, the more ability you have to ignore these little irritations that arise in meditation practice. Uh, because you're already so happy with the breath, you're so content. Uh, you don't want to feel that itch. You don't care about that itch anymore. So what? Just let it alone. Leave it alone. Uh, but in an initial stages, it's often very hard to ignore because your mind is not peaceful yet. Uh, and then the itch and the pain become very problematic. So if you feel a bit itchy, itch yourself, uh, yeah? <laughs> and then you're okay. Move. If you feel a bit kind of uncomfortable, move yourself, especially in the beginning of the meditation. As your m mindfulness becomes uh, stronger, you have more ability to deal with those little problems. Uh, but any stage in the meditation, if something becomes overwhelming, the pain or whatever, then please move, don't torture yourself. There's no point in sitting there with lots of pain and not getting anywhere. Usually that just makes you end up becoming a non-meditator after a while, because meditation does too much suffering. There's enough suffering already in life, yeah? No need to make more suffering here. And sometimes we create suffering in Buddhism. Buddhism is supposed to be something that alleviates some of the pain of existence. It's supposed to be something that adds to the quality of life, not subtracts from the quality of life. For too many people, the spiritual path is something that detracts from the quality of life. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible if that happens. It's supposed to make life better, not worse. And uh, people often get that wrong. So please don't be one of those people who uh, makes the spiritual path be something to be endured. Uh, there's no point in that at all. Uh, make it something enjoyable, something that benefits you, that brings you forward, makes you a better person, more kind-hearted, more gentle, more soft. Uh, if you torture yourself too much in meditation, it can also be very hard sometimes to be kind and gentle to yourself uh, because you, uh, it, it is almost like you are being harsh on yourself by torturing yourself. And then that comes out in your conduct and it actually makes your life more miserable overall uh, and it makes you less able to live well also in regard to, in respect to others as well. So there's many disadvantages uh, in, with that. Uh, so see how that goes. Uh, and uh, yes. Okay, last question for tonight. Gee, okay. <laughs> 
So um, this is it's not as long as it seems because the writing is quite larger, so that's, that's good. For dear Ajahn, I have a different view that life has no purpose. So, there are good people who have lived and contributed to the welfare of mankind in terms of science, medicine, and the arts. Progressively, people know more and are living better. Humanity is definitely better now than in the days of the Dark Ages. Even in the spiritual world of Buddhism, there are good people working hard to purify the teaching to its original form and working hard to teach the Dhamma, while not disputing the seemingly purposeless process of samsara until our final uh, uh, exceed, okay, uh, okay, uh, uh, from the cycle, uh, uh, it should still be a noble purpose for people to contribute to the world instead of wasting their lives uh, just preparing for Nibbana. Uh, yes, I, I agree with you. There is definitely true that life has a purpose in the sense that you do something positive for the world. Uh, and when you do that, you actually practice in the spiritual path anyway. Uh, that's what the spiritual path is about. Uh, it's about having kindness for the world, kindness for the people around you. So you join in doing something good for the world, uh, alleviating a little bit of suffering, alleviating little things. Uh, and by doing that, you are doing good for the world and practice in the spiritual path at the same time. Uh, so uh, absolutely, that is purposeful. But it really is purposeful from, the, from a Buddhist point of view. It is purposeful in light of the spiritual path overall. Uh, yeah, that is where the purpose comes in. Uh, uh, but if you keep on kind of helping out the world, helping out the world, and the world kind of sometimes goes back, sometimes goes forward, uh, and it really is out of control, and you come back again, and you do the same thing again and again, uh, after a while, you get kind of fed up with, with kind of doing the same thing again and again. Uh, and then you kind of uh, uh, become more focused on the spiritual path. Uh, so there is meaning in that, but I would say the real meaning in that is uh, viewed from the point of the spiritual path. That is where the real meaning actually happens in that. Uh. Okay. Anyway, that is all for tonight. Uh, so that is very good timing. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, we'll see you back again uh, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. So let's just finish off by paying respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha.